We're in a series of messages right now called Great Expectations. You know, we have expectations about life many times. It's easy for us to have the expectations that everything is going to be great and we're going to have no problems. Wouldn't that be awesome, right? Those are great expectations. But unfortunately, we know sometimes problems come in our life and we need to know how to deal with those things. Great Expectations is familiar because of the, the book title from Charles Dickens, who wrote about a guy named Pip who navigated his life through wealth and poverty, through dealing with love and rejection, through a world where there was good and evil, and we're in a world just like that today. So how is it that we live in that type of world? How do we live out our potential when struggles come our way, difficulties come our way? How are we to respond to this? I mentioned to you a few weeks ago that uh, we had an uh, uh, issue in our condo. We live in a, a building. It's like a seven-story building. We're on the first floor, and we have uh, a water heater, so we thought it was leaking. And um, it was not. We've got a brand-new water heater, but it kept coming. And what we found out was that there is a pipe where all of the air conditioning systems are connected with their condensation pipes that drain all the way down the building above us. Seven air conditioners had water flowing into our condo for a week and a half. Y'all, this was an unexpected expectation. Do I have a witness out there from anyone? There was a big question. And the question was, will you be like Jesus, right? When you're dealing with the people who caused this problem, who clogged up the pipe that caused all this stuff to come into your house where you're having dehumidifiers running for days on end to try to get this out, will you be like Jesus in that moment? You see, that is the expectation. The expectation for us is to live out the life of Jesus no matter what is happening around us. Whether it's easy or whether it's hard, we're always to be like Jesus. And that's really what this series has been about. What are ways in which that we can live our life that will lead us to be like him? That is the grandest of all expectations. That's how we live out our potential. If I'm like him, I've lived out my potential. If I'm not like him, then I have not, and there's room for growth. Today, we're going to learn about what we can do when we do live out that expectation. Today, we're going to be learning about the expectation of reproduction. God wants us to reproduce ourselves in other people. God wants us to lead other people. A good definition of the word leadership is the word influence. He wants us to influence other people. He wants us to influence them to be like Jesus as we are like Jesus. That's the expectation. The question that we have to ask ourselves is are we living out a worthy example for people around us, a worthy example for them to follow? That's number one on your outline sheet today. Let's go ahead and fill that statement in. We're to set a worthy, reproducible expectation. Paul knew the importance of this. Paul was, one of the, uh, was an apostle who began to share the message of Jesus from city to city, from town to town. He wanted people to come to know Christ. And he wrote a letter to one of those churches that had been established in the, in the city of Corinth. And he made this statement, which I love. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. I want us all to read this out loud together. Here we go. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. That is the statement that all of us should be able to make. Paul was telling the people, I'm being like Jesus, so follow my example. That's a worthy example. That's a reproducible life. That's something that we should want other people to become like because we are like Christ. But can we make that statement? And what does it look like when we become like Christ? What we know is this, that when we become like Christ, we're giving evidence that we have a relationship with God because we're expressing who God is. We read about this in the book of 1 John. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, it says this, And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. Key statement, here it is. In this world, we are like Jesus. We're like Jesus. 
So what was Jesus like? Jesus was the one who expressed the love of God to other people. Through everything that Jesus did, he showed other people that God loved them. So he treated people in a loving way. He treated people who come to work on air conditioning units in loving ways and plumbers that keep on a coming in loving ways or people who clog up a pipe in loving ways or whoever it may be, he treats in loving ways. And that's who it is that we're supposed to be. When you look at Jesus's life, he gives us a great example about how it is that we're supposed to live. Literally, we're just, to, we're just to do what, what he did as he lived. So what did he do? One of my favorite passages is found in the book of Matthew chapter 9, which tells us, about, it tells us about his ministry. It says this, that Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus was a harvester. Jesus was one of those people who were out there doing these things. And he's telling his disciples, there aren't, there aren't enough people like me who are out here doing these things. So what was it that he was doing? What is it that we are to do? What well, is Jesus looked and saw, look on your outline sheet, we are to see other people. It says this, that he saw the crowds. He went to new places to see new people. And as he saw new people, he noticed their condition. He noticed who they were. He noticed that they were in need. In fact, he noticed this about the people. They were like sheep without a shepherd. In other words, these people were without God. These people were without a leader. These people were without the one that they needed in their life. But it began with him noticing the people. That's what we do when we're like Jesus. We look for people. We see people. We put, in, put ourselves in environments where we can see those people who are in need of God. What happens when we do this is once we see them, we can begin to form a connection with them. So we begin to listen to others, just as Jesus listened to others. You can look at other stories throughout the scriptures and see encounters that Jesus had with people who didn't know God and the, the conversation that he had with these people. He listened to people and through his listening to people, he knew what their needs were. And that's what happens for us. We not only to see people, but we also get connected with people and begin conversation with people and get to know people. The scripture said this about this in, in, in about what Jesus did, that he saw the crowds and that he had compassion on the people. I want you to think about compassion in a certain way. Compassion is a form of love. Compassion and love are the same thing, but compassion can be great in strength or it can be weak in strength. Let's associate it with something that we're familiar with. We go to the gas pump and we pick out one of the nozzles to put gas in it. There are these numbers that are there that tell us the ethanol amount or in each of these gases, there's 93 or 87 or 89 or whatever it is. I want you to think about compassion the same way you think about the ethanol strength in gas. Sometimes there's a lot of ethanol. It, it's powerful. It's more pure. In fact, the purer the ethanol, the more there is there, the more powerful that fuel is for whatever it is that it runs. It adds power to it. It helps it in that way. The weaker that number, then the less weak that fuel is. It's the same way with compassion. There can be compassion and it can be a strong, powerful compassion, or there can be a compassion that's a lower number. That's the 87 octane, right? That it's compassion, but it's a weak compassion. You see, the fuel capacity deals with the strength and the power of that fuel. This is what happens with compassion. The more I get to know people and their needs, the more compassionate I become about that person and the number goes up and the power goes up in my life. The more I'm willing to engage 
and the more I'm willing to do for people because my compassion has become stronger. The more we get to know people, the more we want to help people. Jesus spent his life getting to know people and having such a strong compassion, 93 octane, whatever it is, all right? But strong compassion to want to be engaged and do something to, to help change them. How do I know that? Because that's the third thing that we do. We help others. What did it say? He went from town. He saw them, had compassion on them. The scripture also says this, that he healed every disease and sickness. He saw their needs and he reached out to them to help minister to them in their place of need. That's what we do. We meet the need in order to be able to help their ultimate need, to help them see that there's a God who loves you. I want to show that love to you. There's a God who loves you, but there's a God who desires to have a relationship with you as well. It's this God who loves you. The help comes not only in meeting needs, but the help comes in leading people to have a relationship with God. And that's what Jesus was all about. We need more people doing that. That's what it's like to be Jesus. So when I make, if Paul made the statement, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ, what was Paul doing? Paul was going from town to town, ministering to people and sharing the good news of Jesus. Was he not? He went to see people, he went to listen to people, and he went to help meet the needs of people in order for people to come to know God. And that's exactly what we're supposed to be doing in our lives. That should be our lives. So who am I seeing? Who am I getting to know and listening to so that my compassion grows, so that I have strong power to want to engage, and who is it that I'm helping to meet the needs? That is a reproducible life right there. That's what we're supposed to reproduce. But unfortunately, there are people who don't have a worthy reproducible life. They're too busy looking at themselves and listening to themselves and what they want and doing things for themselves and many times at the expense of other people. So what do I do then if I'm not this person? Well, we need help. We need to grow into being this reproducible person. So let's learn some things about that. On your outline sheet, let's look at number two. We need people who are sharp to help us where we are dull. Where does that come from? In the scripture, in, in Proverbs, Solomon wrote this. Solomon's the wisest guy in the Bible besides Jesus. Solomon wrote this. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. It's one of my favorite leadership scriptures or verses to use about influence with other people. The weird thing about it is I have translated and understood that scripture wrong until this week. All right? I've used it so many times. And I read the scripture, I thought, you know what, I, I just want to look at, the, research this a little bit more about where does this come from, what is this really all about? Well, this is what I discovered. Iron doesn't sharpen iron. It just kind of threw me for a loop. Because this entire time I was thinking that iron sharpens iron, so therefore I'm supposed to help sharpen other people. The scripture is still true but it's in reverse. I hope I don't confuse you, all right? Let me put it this way. As iron cannot sharpen iron, so people cannot sharpen people in the same way. What does that mean? Iron can't sharpen iron because it's the same strength and it's the same stone. There's no difference between the two. For something to become sharp, you have to have a strong, sharp, a strong, strong stone that rubs up a weak stone and the strong stone helps to form the weak stone into something that's sharp. So what it's saying is this, just as iron can't sharpen iron, people can't sharpen people if we're the same. Iron and iron is the same. And many times we look at people and we're the same. How can we expect to be sharp if we're dull people rubbing against each other who are exactly the same? Does it just kind of like freak you out thinking about it in a totally different way that way? Or maybe you've always gotten it. I'm just, I am stupid sometimes, y'all. I realize that, okay? And maybe it just took me this long to figure that out. It takes a different substance to sharpen another substance. I want you to think about the stones in these ways. There are two different types of stones. One stone is called a teacher, and another stone is called a student. Isn't it cool to think of it that way? So we need somebody who's stronger 
the teacher who can help the student who is weaker change to become stronger like the teacher. So what does that look like? On your outline sheet, I want you to fill this in that we need someone who is strong. We need someone with virtue. That word virtue is really important because virtue describes the strength of who we are in character. The definition of the word virtue means this. It means moral excellence. It means goodness. It means righteousness. Moral excellence comes from this. I am morally excellent when I put other people before myself. Before myself. Morality really is about what I do for myself or others. If I live for myself and hurt others, that's immoral. If I put others before myself, that's moral. That literally is what the difference is in morality. So I need somebody who has virtue. In other words, I need somebody who is moral, who puts other people before themselves. I need somebody with goodness. Goodness from the word goodness, there is the word good, which is the foundation of the word. In other words, I do good for other people. They do good to improve other people. I need somebody who's righteous. The foundation of righteousness is the word right. They always do the right thing. In other words, everything they do is a benefit to the other person and never a detriment to the other person. That is a person of virtue. It sounds an awful lot like Jesus to me. Does it not sound like Jesus to you? Who's moral? always put others before himself. He was good, always did things to benefit others. He was right, always did what he did to improve the lives of other people. And that's who I'm supposed to be. And that's who I need in my life to help me grow in areas of my weakness. Here's something else about them. We need someone who is more firm. What does that mean? Firmness has to do with belief. I want you to think of it in that way. Their belief is stronger than my belief. I'm the dull one, I'm the student, I need a teacher because I'm not reproducible, all right? I need somebody to help me. I need somebody who is stronger or more, excuse me, more firm in their belief. What that means is this, they believe in God more than I believe in God. It, it means this, when they're faced with a situation, they believe that God's way is right and will choose God's way when I believe that my way is right and I will choose my way. There's a big difference in those two things. So when faced with the same situation, they're stronger, they're, they're more firm in their belief because they believe God's way is always right and choose his way where I'm deciding to go my own way. I need the right example. We need someone who is more strong and the strength part of it has to do with love. Firm in belief, but they're strong in love. Where do we get that from? You remember what I just mentioned ago about compassion and the higher number, the stronger, the power of the fuel? It's the same way it is in our relationships with people. I need people who have a greater compassion for people than I have so that I can learn from their compassion and become like them, that I'll be more willing to engage and to do what's needed to be able to help bring help to other people who are around me. That's who I need in my life. I need those type of people. Y'all, all of us have areas of our life where we need to grow and to become like Jesus, and we need to be seeking out people who are there, who are reproducible examples that we find who can help sharpen who we are. So my question is, am I doing that? And the question for you is, are you doing that? Third thing, we need people who teach us through words and actions. Something else about the people who help us. We need people who are capable to help us and they're capable because they're the right type of people. There are two types of people, we see them. It's found in Proverbs 13 verse 20. It says this, walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of fools suffers harm. There are the wise and there are the fools. Let's talk about the wise people first. We see the wise and we see a description or definition of that word wise on our outline sheet. Did y'all stay with that? That was fast. Well, did y'all get it all on your blanks? Y'all are smiling. Just put wise, all right? I think you're cool if you just put the word wise. Here's the word wise. The word wise means knowledge of what is true or right coupled with just judgment as to action, discernment or insight. What does that mean? That means I have information. I have knowledge. I know the right thing to do and I do it. That's basically what it says. I need people who are wise in my life. 
I need people who have proven their wisdom in my life. Write this down on your sheet. They're wise because of their experiences. These people have gone through the same experiences that I've gone through, yet their response to the experience is different than my experience. They did the right thing. They remained moral, they did what was good, and they did what was right in the same experience. They've gone through the same thing and are an example for me about the proper way and the right way for me to get better. I need people who are good examples, who actually do the right thing when faced with the, right, the same situations. Here's another trait of, this, of theirs. They are wise because of their knowledge. They're wise because they have taken the time to gain knowledge. Wise people go out of their way to gain new information to learn in their mind. Wise people are continual learners. Let me say that again. Wise people are continual learners. And this is what continual learners do. Y'all listen to this. They learn to understand and they learn to know how. They learn to understand why I do what I do and why I need to do what I need to do. And they also learn how am I supposed to do my job? How am I supposed to live my life like Jesus? How am I supposed to do this? What exactly am I supposed to do? The wise people are continually trying to understand people, trying to understand the whys of why we do what we do and the hows of how we do it to the very best of our ability. Those are wise people. We need those people in our life. Are they proving to be people who are continuing to grow themselves? Here's something else about them. The wise are wise because what they say and do match. Not only do they say we should do this, they do the very same thing. That's the definition of wisdom that we just looked at. It's to gain knowledge, right? It's to discern and make judgments. In other words, this is what I know to do. I'm put in a situation. I know the right thing to do, and I do the right thing. Therefore, I am the example to follow. Yet there are many people who tell us to do one thing, yet they live a different life. Do I have a witness out there from anybody, right? That's not wisdom. That's foolishness. That's the other type of person that we can be. Are we following fools? Let's look at the fool. Here are some qualities or character. Or, or, well, let's look at the definition first. A fool is a person who lacks judgment or sense. Remember, the wise have judgment and sense, right? A person who lacks judgment or sense. A person who has been tricked or deceived into appearing or acting silly or stupid. So they've made some really bad choices in their life. Here are some descriptions of these types of of people. First of all, they don't understand. They don't understand. They lack judgment. They may not have had the, the same experiences that we've had, or they may have had the same experiences that we've had, but have failed in their response in those experiences. They didn't succeed. They knew the right thing to do, but they chose not to do it. They were foolish in how they did it. Their experience is not good to follow. Here's the other thing. They don't have knowledge. These people are not the continual learners. These people are not trying to understand the whys of why we should do what we do or the hows of how we are to do life the right way. They're not doing it. They know they should do it, but they don't do it. And when you know you're supposed to do it and you don't do it, you are a a fool, right? Third thing, they've been tricked. These people have been tricked into believing that life is about what I do and what I get for myself instead of my life is about others and what I do to benefit them. They've fallen for a lie and they're fools. I want you to process this in this way, just relating it to yourself. When you're influencing other people and people are looking to you for help, Are you wise or are you a fool? Are you a person who's a worthy example in wisdom because you've gone through the same experiences and actually 
have done the right thing in those experiences, that you are continuing to learn and gain knowledge to understand the whys and the hows of how to do your life, that what you say and what you do match, is that you as a person? Because that's the type of person that's a worthy, reproducible example to follow. And that's who it is that we're supposed to be. That's who it is that we're described to be like. Fourth thing, we set an example as people who listen. We're to be people who listen. Now, I've already talked about listening before, and I talked about listening in relationship to compassion. The more we listen to get to know people, our compassion grows, the strength of our love grows, right? The octane grows. This is a different type of listening. This listening we do because we know we need help and we need our own personal growth. Two verses that help us learn this. One is in Proverbs 12, 15. The way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. We're people who are wanting to listen to others who can help us. Here's another scripture that's similar to this in Proverbs 24, 6. Surely you need guidance to wage war and victory is won through many advisors. We need people. We need many people sometimes around us who are helping us grow and to be the people that God wants us to be. When will we do this? When will we be this type of person, the reproducible type of person who listens? I'll tell you when. First, when we know, we don't know it all. Have you ever met a know-it-all? They don't want to listen to anybody. In fact, they always want to tell you what it is that you're supposed to do. In our staff meeting on Thursdays, uh, many times we'll do a leadership lesson or whatever. So I gave a leadership lesson this past week uh, about being a continual learner. I gave a bunch of other stuff that's not in this message. It's very different than what I'm talking about. But however, I did say this to them, which applies very closely to what we're learning about right now. That people, when you interact with other people, that we can approach them with one of two questions. We can approach that person with, what can I teach you? Or we can approach the person of, what can I learn from you? The person who's the know-it-all always goes up to people with the question of what can I teach you? What can I do for you? What can I do to help you? When the person in humility who understands the need for growth always meets other people with the question, what can I learn from you? And did you know that even though someone may be in a much lower position in leadership or in what they've accomplished in life or whatever it is, you can learn from people who haven't achieved academically or in other areas of your life, what you've achieved. And here's the reason why, because they have a different perspective and experience in their lives. In fact, that's the second thing. We know we need perspective. They see things through eyes that we don't see through because we don't have the same filter. We didn't grow up in their home. We didn't have the same struggles in life that they've had. We haven't gone through the same things. And when we hear how they've dealt with those things and to see how they've dealt with those things and listen to what they've gone through in those things, we hear how we can be stronger by seeing what we learn through them. Yo, all of us need to learn from each other. All of us. The best teacher is the best student, right? Is the one who continues to want to learn and want to grow and to be better. This is what we know, here it is. We know we're stronger together. We know that together we can do so much more than we can apart. It's one of my favorite passages in Ecclesiastes 4. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Y'all, we need each other to be strong. Do we not? We need each other. Why? Because God wants us to help each other to become people who are reproducible examples as we're helping each other become like Christ. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes right now. 
What is God teaching you today? It might be that you notice some areas in your life where you're not like Jesus and you know you need to change. And God is challenging you today to find somebody who's wise, somebody who's experienced, someone who is a stronger and more firm stone than you are that can help sharpen you into being someone who is more firm and more strong. God is leading you to know that for some of you. I'm weak in this area. I need somebody who's gone through the same thing and who has succeeded. I want to encourage you to pray and ask God to bring those people in your life that you need as mentors in your life. And I want to encourage you to pray that God would, that God would give you the strength to take action to find people who will help you become the person who's reproducible so that you can change. Wouldn't it be awesome in this school year that we would go to school ourselves on what it is to be like Jesus and to become more like him and to gain some education? God might be leading you to do that very thing right now. It might be some of you today don't have a relationship with God. God loves you no matter what you've done. We don't deserve his love. He loves us even though we don't deserve it. It's the anyway love. God loves us anyway. Why? Because he sees something in us that he desires. He desires a relationship with us. That's why he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to show his love for us so that we can be forgiven. And I want to encourage you today, if you're not a Christian, today is the day for you to give your life to him. At the end of our service, back in the back, to my right, to your left, there's a single door with a glass window. We have someone back there already for you to help you. We'd love to just answer any questions that you have about what it is to be a Christian, to help you pray a prayer of commitment to give your life to Christ, to receive what Jesus has done for you through his death and resurrection. We would love to help you today. It might be today that you're going through some other struggles that you just need somebody to pray with you about. That's a place to go. We would love to just pray with you about any concerns or needs that you have where we can be a support for you, to be strength for you, to help you in your time of need. Whatever it is that God's leading you to do today, put some action behind what it is that you've learned. As I pray, I want to invite you to pray as well. Father, thank you for what you've taught me this week. God, I pray that you would help me to continue to become Christ-like, to believe in you more in areas where I take control and believe I know best, to love you more when I have turned my back on you and loved what I desire more of this world. God, help me to see it and help me to change. God, thank you so much for what you've taught us today. Let us understand today, God, from you, just how much you believe in us, that you believe we can be different, and you believe that we can bring change in this world. We ask you, God, for your help. Help us to be the example who can say, as Paul did, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Let's continue our worship.